Well, good evening. I'll take this off. On behalf of myself and my colleague, Dr. Ross, uh, all the members of Radiology Consultants, I just want to thank the organizers for inviting us to speak to you about the past, present, and future of medical imaging, particularly here in the interior. The renowned Danish physicist Niels Bohr once wryly commented that making predictions about the future is fraught with difficulty. So I think we should take the uh, wisdom of Mark Twain and first look to the past to help guide us as to what might transpire in the future. Um, the history of medical imaging really uh, started near the close of the 19th century in 1895, and this gentleman, uh, Wilhelm Rankin, who was a German physicist and mechanical engineer, uh, discovered x-rays. Uh, like is often the case in scientific discovery, this was truly a happy accident. He wasn't looking for x-rays. Uh, he noticed an unusual phosphorescent light in his laboratory and with further experimentation, uh, was able to produce the first x-ray that we see here. This is an x-ray of his wife's left hand. And this discovery, uh, it seems perhaps unusual to us today, but it actually rapidly spread throughout the world in newspapers. And in fact, today we would consider it a viral event. And so x-rays within literally a matter of a couple of months were being, um, being performed on either side of the Atlantic. Um, shortly after Rankin discovered the x-rays, Thomas Edison made a contribution in helping to develop what is called fluoroscopy, or real-time x-rays, that offer an important dynamic dimension uh, to x-rays, as we see here of a patient doing a swallowing study. And the patient swallowing barium, which is a contrast or dye agent, these were actually rapidly developed shortly after the turn of the century. There's an interesting side note, actually. One of the, <clears throat> whoops, we're kind of going all over the place, but uh, just as an interesting sidebar, one of the people who helped develop contrast for the blood vessels, I didn't need contrast, was also involved in the development of lobotomies, for which he was awarded, uh, I believe, a Nobel Prize. Anyways, by the mid-20th century, uh, x-rays, or as they're formerly known as radiographs, had really become a mature technology and were widely used throughout medicine. But they remained uh, limited in a significant way because they're two-dimensional compositional type images, meaning that the structures, the soft tissues, the organs tend to overlap and can obscure the diagnosis. But there was a revolution about to happen, not just in medicine, but throughout society with the development of the integrated circuit and microprocessors, which of course brought in enormous amounts of computational power. With improvements in computers, it became feasible for the first time to make something known as a cross-sectional image. Now, the technique for doing this had been actually known for several decades, but without the power of the computers, couldn't be done. So with the <coughs> development of uh, computers, the era of cross-sectional imaging became feasible. The first cross-sectional type imaging scanner was the CT scanner, or CAT scanner, standing for computed tomography. We see one of the early versions here. At that time, due to technical restrictions, could only scan the head. But this was still a form of x-ray. The x-ray would actually literally spin around the patient and with the computer could form these new type of cross-sectional images. This new type of cross-sectional imaging provided a different way of looking at the body that would truly revolutionize medicine. And here we have an example of an early uh, head CT from the 1970s. And from our modern perspective, it may not be all that impressive. It looks kind of grainy. But it's important to recall that at the time, it had never been possible to directly view the body in this fashion. So this sort of cross-sectional 
approach to looking at the body was a revolution in. And this would usher in a new era in medicine. For example, bleeding in the head or brain, which before the advent of CT, really could only be inferred indirectly based on clinical findings, perhaps a spinal tap, or even performing an angiogram to see displacement of the brain. Now, with CAT scans, you could directly visualize the bleeding. And this transformed the diagnosis of bleeding as well as all sorts of diseases throughout the body. Shortly after CT was developed and introduced into clinical medicine, two additional cross-sectional type modalities were developed and implemented. This included MRI. And this is a prototype of the first scanner that was developed in the late 70s. Dr. Demadian on the left was one of the fathers of MRI and also included ultrasound. Now MRI, unlike CT, does not use radiation. Instead, it uses a very powerful magnet to provoke radiofrequency signals from the soft tissues of the body. And this provides exquisite imaging of the soft tissues that's particularly useful for looking at the brain, at the joints, and solid organs. Hopefully, we, there we go. So for example, this is an MRI of the spine, and it's very apparent to see the spinal cord surrounded by the bright cerebrospinal fluid. You can make out the individual discs between the vertebra of the spine. So <clears throat> similarly, we can look at the joints and we can get uh, a very detailed look at the cartilage, the meniscus, the tendons, the ligaments, all through MRI. So ultrasound, like MR, does not use radiation, instead uses sound waves to generate images. So that makes it particularly useful for pregnant women and young uh, children to avoid the radiation. It's also a dynamic type exam, and hopefully this will play, but this is a sweep through the uterus showing the fetus. So a beautiful way to look at the body. You can actually visualize physiologic uh, function, which is one of the strengths of ultrasound. Okay. It can also leverage the Doppler phenomena to visualize blood flow, so it's a particularly useful technique for looking at blood vessels. So by the 1990s, these three new techniques that allowed sort of a cross-sectional view of the body had really matured and become used throughout medicine. But in the 90s, another innovation would happen called sometimes volumetric imaging. And what this means is we could now obtain extremely small slices or cross-sections to essentially create a precise three-dimensional data set or map of the human body and produce images like you see here, a three-dimensional rendering with this photorealistic appearance. So this was extraordinary, but it did come with new challenges. In particular, the amount of data being produced by all of this imaging proved burdensome and frankly was no longer, uh, we could no longer use the former methods for storing and looking at images which were film. So this would <clears throat> bring about a new uh, transformation in medical imaging, the digital transformation. Again, historically, images had always been printed on film and displayed on light boxes, as you see here, but with the increasing amount of data and so forth, this no longer was practical. So around the turn of the century and the early 2000s, this transformation occurred where we shifted from analog to digital images. Instead of light boxes, powerful workstations with multiple monitors like this would be used to view images. Instead of a library full of films, there is a server that was often called a PACS or picture archiving computer system that would store the images. This allowed the images to be transmitted throughout the entire health enterprise and in fact anywhere there's an internet connection they could be transmitted. The historical modalities that previously were analog like mammography, radiography, were uh, transformed into the digital ecosystem as well. And at this time, uh, some software tools became available 
particularly voice recognition, that would allow the instantaneous generation of reports, which could be then immediately transmitted into the uh, electronic medical record. With these advances, new industries actually started because images could be accessed anywhere literally around the world. A whole new industry called teleradiology developed, meaning that the interpretation could be performed anywhere. So in many ways, this had a similar impact as the digital transformation, which was simultaneously occurring at the same time throughout the rest of society with devices like the iPhone that would change how we communicate digitally, how we do transactions and e-commerce and stream video and media. Similar impact was happening in medical imaging and really throughout all of medicine. We discussed how this had an increase in the amount of data being produced, uh, but at the same time, we enjoyed increased productivity some, from some of these new software tools, which meant we could do more and more exams each and every day. And because the results of these exams were rapidly disseminated throughout the entire uh, health enterprise or hospital, uh, we became increasingly important at the point of care for the provision of health care. All of this meaning that imaging really became a 24-7 type endeavor. 365 days a year, it had to be available. So I think now we can turn our attention a little bit back in time and look at Fairbanks around the same time that microprocessors were about to be introduced and cross-sectional imaging was about to become available. And this is the time <clears throat> around when the flood occurred. It's helpful to recall that healthcare at that time in Fairbanks was a little bit different than what we know today, largely driven through two primary clinics, TVC and Fairbanks Clinic, as well as the old St. Joseph's Hospital. But with the flood in 67 and then additional changes that followed shortly afterwards, that would change. Of course, the flood, as we see here, severely damaged St. Joseph's, and that set the ground for establishing the Greater Fairbanks Community Hospital Foundation, which was charged with building a new community hospital. And Fairbanks Memorial opened in 1972. With the opening of the hospital, this would start to shift healthcare towards a more hospital-based system. And shortly after that, of course, the pipeline, which brought a large influx of pipeline workers that represented a dramatic demographic shift. These workers, of course, had many new healthcare needs, including emergency services. This is an excerpt from an article in the New York Times from 1975, describing some of the challenges being encountered in the pipeline camps with all the injuries. In fact, every day here in Fairbanks, about three to four workers on average were transferred for emergency care, which was a dramatic change from pre-pipeline days. About this time, additional health care facilities uh, were developed, the Medical Dental Arts Building. There was even talk of constructing a second hospital with the Teamsters. And this brought in more physicians and more specialists, which helped keep care local and avoided the need for outside referral. So all of these factors, the demographic shift, the greater number of physicians working here, uh, really increased the demand for diagnostic services, which happened to coincide with this new cross-sectional imaging that was becoming available for the first time that improved the ability to diagnose. And so these new modalities would soon be available in Fairbanks in the 1970s with ultrasound. By the early 80s, CT was available. And then in 1991, the first MRI scanner was installed here in Fairbanks. Towards the end of the 20th century and the beginning of this century, the healthcare pendulum would swing back to where it started in the 60s in some respects. Recognizing issues relating to cost containment, there was a greater emphasis on outpatient and ambulatory care. And the foundation decided to build the Fairbanks Imaging Center, which opened in 2005. 
This coincided with the digital transformation occurring in medical imaging. And as a result, this was a fully digital environment or ecosystem and offered digital mammography, digital radiography, as well as the latest MR and CT scanners. Since that time, we've had further developments, particularly in the field of women's health and breast imaging. Uh, we've continually improved our digital mammography services, improved the stereotactic biopsy capabilities. That's important to help avoid surgical type biopsies. We've done breast MRI for several years and have also added MR guided breast biopsy. And then in 2015, three dimensional mammography, or what is also known as tomosynthesis, was introduced at the hospital. Tomosynthesis is again a cross sectional type imaging modality and is particularly helpful in women who have dense breasts to help uncover the cancer that is otherwise hidden in the dense breast tissue. And then most recently, uh, we've also started doing more innovative methods for helping breast surgeons localize the cancer at the time of surgery using uh, this innovative device, which is really a radiofrequency transmitter that we implant several days or even weeks before surgery. And Dr. Ross, I believe, will touch on this a little bit. Most recently, uh, we've updated the CT scanners with what is uh, the most advanced technology available. This is an image of what's called the FORCE, which was installed in the hospital in 2019 and was the most sophisticated scanner available in the world. And then just this past April, the baby brother of this machine was installed in the imaging center. These new scanners have a large variety of new technologies, but some of the most important include the ability to significantly reduce the amount of radiation for scans, as well as something called dual energy technology that we'll talk about a little bit. And they're also extremely fast in certain scanning modes. In fact, we can scan from the head to the toe of a patient in under two seconds under some circumstances. Regarding radiation dose, <clears throat> uh, several years ago, rightly so, there was increasing awareness that radiation uh, was an increasing concern. And so with the installation of these new scanners, we have technology that lets us significantly reduce the radiation dose. Now this varies depending on the body part being imaged, but for in the example of the chest, we can actually get the dose down by over 90% in some cases. And the new dual energy technology, uh, which has a variety of uses, but one application is helping reduce uh, radiation dose because what it allows us to do is to digitally subtract the dye that is given to the patient and produce what is called a virtual non-contrast image. One of the benefits is that in the past we had to scan the patient twice, but now with dual energy technology we just scan them once and so the radiation dose is cut in half. This dual energy technology has a number of other benefits. It lets us visualize bleeding quite well. For example, active bleeding in the bowel, as we see here. You'll notice this image looks a little funny. It's kind of orange looking. That's the computer actually coloring in where all the dye is. And so it helps us detect things like bleeding in that way. It can also be useful when looking at the bones. For example, on your left, is a CT of the knee, and there's no fracture there, but the patient has a sore knee because they bumped it. So it leaves us wondering, well, are they actually injured? But we can look at the dual energy image here, and this bright spot is a bone contusion, which is accounting for their pain. This will be another video clip, but these technologies are particularly well suited to cardiovascular imaging. Um, we can introduce the fourth dimension, the dimension of time, and actually in three, see a three-dimensional image of the heart beating as well as the aortic valve, which is there opening and closing. And so that adds a, a unique perspective. 
and I'll try to. These new scanners are also particularly adept at looking at the vessels, including the coronary arteries. We can make really beautiful images of the coronaries for detecting stenosis and plaque. We can do CT calcium scoring, which I believe Dr. Ross might touch on. It's very helpful for making <coughs> prognostic uh, estimates of uh, future risk of cardiac events. And of course, this is true throughout the entire vascular system. These three-dimensional images are actually quite helpful for very complicated patients when there's a number of findings. They really help uh, <coughs> bring all of the data points together so that you can rapidly assess things. Um, so imaging basically has just become more and more prevalent and more relied upon for medical practice across the board. As a result, here in Fairbanks, what we're finding is that we're doing more and more image-guided procedures. For example, here we're doing a biopsy of a tumor in the lung. And now, in the last year or so, we've actually started to do treatment using image-guided procedures. So on the left, what you see is a special probe being placed into a tumor in the kidney. And then through that probe, cryogenic fluid goes in and actually freezes the tumor so that you can avoid surgery. So these types of procedures are going to become more and more common, I, I believe, uh, both here and just across the country. So in the next couple years, we expect that our ultrasound equipment will be upgraded as well as our MR scanners. This will be particularly important uh, for things like prostate cancer, as Dr. Ross will talk about. I haven't mentioned PET imaging, but I think it's important. PET is another type of imaging that is particularly useful in cancer evaluation. But it uses a radioactive isotope that is not available, or is at least not produced here in Alaska. It's produced in Seattle. And as a result, we, have, uh, we cannot obtain the isotope to pr uh, perform PET imaging. And this is a real limitation, because cancer patients need PET scans. There's just no doubt about it. And so I'm hopeful that at some point in the near future that a production facility can be created in the state to help allow us to offer this important service. So where are we going from here? Um, recalling the quote from Mark Twain and the wisdom of looking to the past for guidance to the future, I think we should recall the 1970s the demographic shifts that help transform care locally here in Fairbanks, and recognize that we're now, again, in the middle of a demographic shift. This is a shift of a different nature, however. We all recognize that the, patient, the population is getting older. In fact, the World Health Organization estimates that about a quarter of the world's population is going to be over 60 by 2050. And as these charts help demonstrate this will happen here in Alaska, in fact, perhaps even more pronounced, with a state estimating that nearly a third of the population will be over 65 in 2050. This growth in the older population will occur while the working population stays just about the same. The overall population in the state will increase only marginally. This tells us that there will be an increasing need for health care resources. But it also tells us that the workforce to provide those resources will remain about the same. Those increased, uh, the increased need in health care will center on age-related diseases, which are well known and very predictable. Things like cancer, including lung, breast, uh, prostate, and colorectal cancer cardiovascular disease, primarily in the form of coronary disease and stroke, arthritis, which represents a significant impact on the quality of life as people get older, and neurodegenerative disorders, particularly Alzheimer's disease, which has a devastating impact on patients and families. These will become more common, and these are the types of issues we're going to be dealing with. Since our workforce limitations are also known, I'm hopeful that technologies such as artificial intelligence can enhance our productivity so that we can meet the increased need for healthcare over the coming years. And with that, I believe 
it's Dr. Ross, we'll turn it over to him to go into the future. Uh, so for this next part of the discussion, I'd really like to frame everything in the context of public health. Uh, as Dr. Fowler mentioned, you know, we're facing a, a population that's uh, getting older. People are living longer with chronic medical conditions. People are living longer with cancer. So um, this is a slide from the CDC that shows uh, age-adjusted death rates in a developed country, the United States. The two major killers are heart disease and cancer. By far and away, this accounts for the vast majority of uh, mortality in, in the United States. Of course, this is 2019 and 2020 data, so it includes COVID. Uh, in younger people, trauma is always uh, number one cause of death. Uh, and then another major killer for uh, uh, people in a developed country like the United States is stroke. So it's impossible to touch really on all of these topics, but I'll try to comment on a few of those major ones. So firstly, coronary artery disease. Uh, we as physicians, um, uh, you know, it's important to recognize that it is far easier to prevent a disease than it is to cure something uh, by the time it's really advanced or something has progressed really far. So um, coronary artery disease is something that has a major impact on our society. So we in radiology have developed CT scans of the heart uh, that allow us to accurately quantify the amount of calcification in coronary arteries. And using that number, we can then predict the risk of future, future uh, cardiovascular events. Uh, not only that, we can help uh, guide primary care providers in choosing targeted uh, doses or degree of intensity statin medications to help lower the risk of future cardiovascular events. Uh, Dr. Fowler mentioned briefly about coronary CTA. Uh, we can create uh, images of the coronary arteries with high degree of spatial resolution to really accurately and with a high degree of fidelity characterize areas of narrowing in the coronary arteries. Um, we can look very closely at plaques. This cartoon demonstrates uh, a cholesterol plaque in one of the coronary arteries. We can measure the density of the center and the thickness of the rim around it and get some sort of estimation of the stability of that plaque, whether it's something that might rupture and cause a future cardiac event. We're doing a lot more cardiac MRI these days, which allows a really uh, incredible overview of cardiac structure and function, how the heart is, how, what the size of the heart is, what the mass of the myocardium is, um, how, as a pump, it's functioning, how the valves are, if they're competent, um, as well as things like myocardial infarction, also known as heart attack. This is a cross-sectional cardiac MRI image through the ventricles that shows uh, this brighter area uh, in the left ventricle, which is uh, subendocardial delayed gadolinium enhancement, which is a finding of myocardial infarction. So there are many uses for cardiac MRI. Another problem of the blood vessels is essentially uh, what we is commonly known as stroke. Uh, there are many types of stroke. Really, people think of embolic stroke, which is when a tiny little blood clot, typically from the heart or the carotid arteries, makes, it way, makes its way to the brain and lodges within peripheral uh, arteries that supply certain territories of the brain. So people have heard the phrase, time is brain. It's uh, absolutely true. The brain is composed of millions, billions of neurons, and these cells are exquisitely sensitive to changes in local uh, nutrient availability, which is delivered by the blood. So um, an area of the brain that stars for oxygen immediately is uh, manifested in uh, physical exam findings. Hemifacial weakness, unilateral weakness, uh, speech disturbance or visual disturbance. So we've developed in radiology a whole pathway of imaging to really rapidly identify uh, patients who are having stroke using clinical uh, features, physical examination, to shuttle those patients into the CT scanner as rapidly as possible, uh, and then perform a dedicated total cerebrovascular stroke study to uh, not only try to recognize stroke, identify what area of the brain that might be infected, but whether it's something that we could actually intervene upon. So part of that imaging is uh, a vital component. It is what's called perfusion imaging. We can give contrast agents in the blood and then watch as that contrast washes in and washes out of the brain, which allows us to see how the brain is perfusing. 
Um, it allows us to identify areas of infarction, which are areas of the brain that are already dead, but also areas of the brain that are at risk for uh, dying but haven't yet died. That's what we call the ischemic penumbra. So this is very important in the decision making and the workflow of stroke management. Radiology is playing an increasingly large role in uh, management uh, and treatment of stroke, uh, not only through uh, aiding in the clinical decision making as it applies to giving the intravenous medication TPA, which will help lice clot or bust it and allow those vessels to reperfuse, or actually go in with catheters and wires and retrieve clot and allow those areas of the brain to perfuse. Switching gears a little bit away from uh, coronary artery disease, cardiac disease, and stroke to cancer. This is after cardiac disease, the number two killer in uh, developed countries such as the United States. The top four cancers here, here we see number one is lung and bronchial carcinomas. Number two would be female breast cancers. Male breast cancer does happen, but it's much less common. Uh, prostate cancer, and then colon and rectal cancer. So for lung cancer, radiology plays a vital role in multiple steps along the pathway from screening to diagnosis and staging and ultimately treatment. Uh, we are starting to perform a lot more screening uh, CTs of the chest. These are examinations that are quite low dose. Um, uh, lung cancer, currently all, all comers, five-year mortality is approximately 20%, but there's quite a dichotomy between patients who have very early stage disease, malignancy that's localized, versus malignancy that's spread to the chest wall or lymph nodes or other solid organs like the liver. Um, so it's very helpful, and really this is a theme throughout all medicine, as I mentioned, it's really helpful to be able to catch cancer very early, as early as we possibly can, because that can dramatically affect outcomes. So uh, screening CT of the chest uh, provides about a 20% reduction in mortality. This will vary by study. Uh, current recommendations provided by the USPSTF, which is a third party that reviews medical data, provides recommendations, currently recommends uh, low-dose screening CT of the chest annually for adults who are 50 to 80 years old, uh, who have a history of 20-pack year smoking history. This is actually just reduced from 30 years. And uh, patients who are currently smoker who have quit in the past 15 years. Uh, in radiology, whenever we look at images, we try to be extremely organized. We look at how things are shaped, how their margins are, what they're doing to the structures around them. And uh, we, we really like our, uh, our, our standardized um, reporting tools. So in lung cancer screening, we have a tool called Lung Rads, which helps us to identify based on size, uh, whether something is benign, something that doesn't really need further follow-up, or something that we need to pay a little bit closer attention on. Uh, maybe follow up in six months or something that is suspicious enough that might warrant us to actually pursue a biopsy or um, a PET CT. Um, Dr. Fowler showed uh, some images of procedures that we do in radiology. Here is another one on screen left. This is a patient who's lying on their back in the CT scanner. We've scanned through their chest and we have a needle that we've advanced through their chest into a suspicious looking pulmonary nodule. So we're able to biopsy that tissue uh, and provide diagnosis. Uh, and then using CT as well, we're able to stage cancer. We're able to find out you know, exactly where it is using size criteria and morphologic features. We can look at lymph nodes to see if they're suspicious. They could be involved by malignancy, what it's doing to the chest wall. This uh, is a very aggressive mass here on screen right that's invading through the chest wall as well as into the fat of the anterior immediate steinum. Uh, switching gears to breast cancer. Uh, breast cancer is the number one, two, number two killer for women. Uh, of course, the staple of breast cancer screening is mammography. Uh, on the cartoon here on screen right, we have a woman who has her breast positioned in one of our mammogram machines, which uh, is an extremely precise way of imaging the breast. We apply gentle compression, which allows us to uh, create a very uniform image reduces radiation to the chest, and uh, we get very incredible images of breast tissue and the fat around it and the skin. Um, we can see over time on screen left here, 
in that red box, there's a little bit of developing uh, brightness, that white stuff, what we call uh, a developing asymmetry, is a suspicious finding. Uh, the idea of Bren's density, density has to do with the degree of fibroglandular tissue that exists in the breasts uh, as opposed to fat. So on far left, we have a breast that's mostly fat. And then all the way on the right, we have uh, extremely dense breasts. This is a breast tissue that has a higher proportion of fibroglandular tissue relative to fat. You can imagine that it would be much easier for us to find a mass in a breast that's mostly composed of fat uh, because it would stand out. There'd be greater degree of contrast between the, the mass and the fat around it, which is mostly dark. Whereas on the far right, in an extremely dense breast, uh, the fibroglandular tissue, the sort of brighter tissue, is the same uh, color as malignancy, so it can hide things. We've developed a number of tools to deal with dense breasts. Uh, tomosynthesis, as Dr. Fowler mentioned, is a 3D view of the breasts on screen left here. Um, the furthest to the left image shows uh, what's a two-dimensional mammographic image of the breast that essentially looks normal. But on uh, just to the right of that, in the white circle, there's an area of uh, what we call architectural distortion, where the tissue of the breast is being pulled in. This is a suspicious feature and something that would warrant us to pursue a biopsy of the breast. And then on screen right, another example of a, of a mass that's uh, in the middle right image, a mass that's being partially obscured by overlying breast tissue is much more conspicuous on the far right image of the blue arrow. We're beginning to perform a lot more screening MRI of the breast. And uh, this allows us to really get an incredible lay of the land, not only visualize the breast, but the chest wall, the axillary lymph nodes, portions of the mediastinum uh, and liver often. And uh, we're currently performing screening MRI for patients who are considered high risk for breast cancer. These are patients who either have a genetically increased uh, risk for breast cancer based off of BRCA mutation, for example, or a history of radiation to their chest if they have a history of lymphoma, perhaps, or for whatever reason, just their calculated lifetime risk is 20% or more. And then other, some other indications, just personal history of breast cancer. Uh, we perform uh, breast biopsies in radiology. Typically, this is done by either ultrasound. Those set of four images to the left show a mass uh, in image A there. Uh, which is suspicious, and then that sort of brighter line is a needle that we've positioned into the center of the mass. We have vacuum-assisted needles that actually suck the tissue in and then cut across to take uh, an enough tissue so our pathology doctors can come to a conclusion about what these masses are. So we do a lot of ultrasound-guided biopsies of the breast, and then on the right, uh, we're, this is a mammographic-guided biopsy called a stereotactic biopsy, which we often perform for calcifications. And uh, in breast cancer, calcifications can be a marker of breast cancer. Uh, historically, much of the, so, so once we've diagnosed a breast cancer, that patient then needs to go to see a surgeon and they're treated by lumpectomy. The surgeon will go in and actually excise the tumor. But a lot of times these cancers are very small, even on the order of millimeters in size. So uh, it's not something that a surgeon can easily feel with their hands or use tactile sensation to really uh, identify. So uh, a lot of times in the recent past, we've mostly used wires. We've positioned wires that would actually have a little hook on the end of it. The hook would be sort of uh, positioned right at the site of the cancer. The wire would exit the patient's body and the surgeon could use that in the operating room as part of their dissection to guide them down to the malignancy and perform a lump acting around that. These days with our uh, technology, we're now inserting a lot more RFID chips that emit a radio frequency uh, signal. And later in the OR, the, and these can be placed days or even weeks before the surgery, um, which is much more convenient for the patient. And then later in the OR, uh, the patient or the surgeon can use a wand to actually identify that RFID chip, which we've positioned directly in the center of that uh, cancer. Uh, touching briefly on prostate cancer, uh, we perform quite a bit of prostate MRI, which allows us to see with exquisite anatomic detail uh, the prostate, the 
architecture of the prostate gland itself, the tissue around it, the capsule, um, the seminal vesicles which are nearby and the bladder. So we're performing these examinations to not only screen for prostate cancer in patients who have elevated PSAs, but also to stage uh, cancers once they've been diagnosed with prostate cancer. And uh, here we have a set of MRI images that show a in the red, a, a suspicious lesion by our, our imaging features that it, it's uh, suspicious for prostate cancer. Uh, we aren't really performing this much up here. This is kind of hot off the press. New on the horizon of radiology is um, this idea of theranostics, which is combined uh, diagnostic imaging in the form of PET with therapeutic imaging. So these are medications essentially that um, have a ligand that has a tropism for malignancy of interest. In this case, PSMA has a tropism for prostate cancer, uh, but it's also tied to a radioisotope. So it allows us to see where the cancer has gone in the body and at the same token, deliver a therapeutic dose of radiation to that tissue. And this is just an example of one of the dramatic responses people can have. All these little black dots uh, are presumably metastases, either in lymph nodes or the bones. Prostate cancer tends to spread to bones uh, after treatment with PSMA, uh, a dramatic response. There's residual uptake in portions of uh, normal tissue like liver and kidneys and salivary glands up top. Colorectal cancer is also an extremely um, important area of radiology and medicine in general. Fairbanks. Uh, I would actually I'll take that back. In the continental US, a lot of colonoscopies are performed by gastroenterologists. These are specialized, uh, subspecialized internal medicine doctors. Uh, in Fairbanks, a lot of our colonoscopies are performed by general surgeons or family medicine doctors. And uh, they, they've filled a great need in our community. And as our population is aging, we expect the need for screening colonoscopy to go up. And we in radiology can help fill that role by performing examinations called, uh, what's called virtual colonoscopy. It's essentially a CT of the abdomen and pelvis. And using uh, imaging reconstruction, we can create 3D images of the colon and, in a sense, kind of fly through the lumen of the colon as if you're doing an optical colonoscopy. And this is just a side-by-side -side imaging comparison showing a polyp, that little sort of uh, ball of tissue there uh, in the lumen of the colon projecting into the lumen of the colon as seen on virtual colonoscopy, and that same polyp as seen on optical colonoscopy. So this is one of the areas that we can provide value in radiology and help fill a need in our community. Uh, rectal cancer. We are performing quite a bit of MRI for new diagnoses of rectal cancer. Uh, with this technique, we can look at the mucosa of the rectum, the muscular wall around the rectum, um, the varying various layers of the rectum, the fat around it, and the layers of fascia that go into the pelvis. So this allows us to uh, help surgeons and oncologists in their decision making as far as how to treat patients with chemotherapeutics or surgery or both, as well as radiation therapy. Radiology is increasingly taking a larger role in the treatment of malignancy. We can position a needle basically anywhere in the body. There's always places you don't want to put a needle, but uh, we can safely guide a needle to uh, essentially anywhere. Once we have that needle in place, we can either biopsy it, we can take a tissue sample, or we can make the tip of that needle really hot, or we can make it really cold. And what that do, does is causes a, a very local thermal injury to the tissue, burns it or freezes it. And this is a way that we can uh, with uh, minimal in invasion, treat cancers often of the lung or liver or kidney. We are blessed in our community to have a uh, uh, radiation oncologist named Dr. Shahada. Dr. Shahada uh, performs uh, radiation therapy, external beam radiation therapy. On the very top image, we can see a little uh, pulmonary nodule, a lung cancer, which uh, using some very advanced machines, He's able to deliver high doses of radiation uh, locally to that tissue with millimeter accuracy. And we can see the malignancy has essentially vanished at follow-up. Uh, so obviating the need for any sort of surgery. 
It's an incredible tool. And then really the future of radiology is um, a massive topic. We could fill so many different lectures. Uh, historically, radiology has really embraced advancing technology. Uh, radiology is full of software engineers and uh, uh, mechanical engineers, people who have interest in informatics and technology, and we embrace technology. And it, we're one of the most rapidly changing fields of medicine, and it is, it's already changed. I'm, I'm a young radiologist, but I've already seen many changes. Uh, the next thing on the horizon that's going to really revolutionize uh, radiology and medicine in general is artificial intelligence. Uh, as well as uh, data science. So artificial intelligence has already helped us reduce the radiation that we deliver as part of our diagnostic examinations. It's helped us improve our efficiency in our daily workflows. Uh, it's helped uh, screen images. We routinely apply an AI algorithm to help us screen our breast uh, mammograms to identify things like masses and calcifications. Um, so that is a, a huge area of radiology and medicine that's just going to be blowing up in the next few years. Radiomics is the application of data science and informatics to radiology. When we look at images, say a CT scan, we can sort of see at a bird's eye view. Our eyes are pretty good at finding major things. But the reality is there is much information in the images that we just cannot really see. Uh, things like um, body mass index, fat, the volume of and, and density of muscular tissue in the body. Uh, so, so many things that it's hard to pick up with the human eye, but machines are exqu exquisitely good at picking up some of those really fine details. So that'll change radiology. And then uh, all of these tools, radiologists are really big on efficiency and workflow optimization because as the population ages, we're expecting larger volumes across all of our imaging modalities. And that's coupled to often uh, staffing shortages. So um, we want to be as efficient as possible and to deliver the best health care uh, in a cost-effective and, and safe way. So that's all I had. I wanted to say thank you again for being here, listening to us uh, talk and tell you a little bit about radiology. And Dr. Well, I think, I think I want to start. What, Dr. Fuller, appreciate the, the history. I mean, this explosion of technology and health opportunities in the probably mid, mid 80s into early 90s with MRI in particular. Then along comes another big jump, just thinking in our last 30, 35 years cardiology. And what I witnessed with cardiology, it was the community who was pushing that, and it was the internal med docs, Dr. Carroll and Dr. Berger in particular. So you had this group of docs in the community pulling together to say, let's bring cardiology to Fairbanks. When, when I look at this hole that Dr. Ross mentioned in virtual colonoscopies, You've got the radiologists pushing. How does the community engage in something like that? It seems like a, a, a great need in this community. It, it really is. And uh, I, if my memory serves me correctly, uh, if you looked at the utilization rate of colonoscopy or colon screening in this community for many years, decades, you know, it's, it's largely underutilized. Um, and so there's, there's, there's already a need for enhanced screening, but that need is obviously going to increase as the population grows older. Um, <clears throat> so how to bring that about? I think it, it, you know, one of the most important things that's happened in my tenure over the last two decades um, has been the increase in collaboration, particularly in the realm of cancer. This started, uh, I believe, when Dr. Carroll was still with us. Uh, with our tumor board, that basically is a weekly meeting where all the various uh, doctors come together and discuss individual cases. And, and this is incredibly useful for everybody, particularly the patient, as you might imagine. Um, I think it's at that level uh, where perhaps the seed for this could be planted uh, because it's a, it's a complex 
problem that requires expertise from all these individuals. Um, and it requires coordination. Um, you know, it's very easy to go buy some new tool. We can go down to Home Depot, I can buy some fancy tool. But unless I'm working with a team, unless uh, everyone is on the same page of music, you're, you're not really using your resource particularly well. And so particularly in colonoscopy, uh, I think that's the place to start, is a, a sort of a meeting of the minds with the surgeons, family practice physicians, and so forth, to develop a real program. That's the other, that's the other thing about screening, is screening is not your one and done. Screening is something you do regularly. That's all the statistics that we can show you all are based on the idea this is being done each and every year or over a period of time. And, and that requires a system. And the same is true for colonoscopy type screening. It requires a system that everyone is participating in. So. Questions? Oh, you mentioned uh, um, the colonoscopy. Does virtual colonoscopies pick up diverticulitis and how well? Yeah, um, I could grab the mic for you. Uh, the answer is extremely well. It's very easy for us to see diverticula on CT scan. When we do a virtual colonoscopy, we apply a little bit of colonic insufflation, meaning we uh, essentially pressurize the colon, and diverticula are little outpouchings, and those would fill with air. We'd be able to see diverticula, diverticulosis very well. In fact, we see diverticulosis diverticula every day on CT scans. Mm -hmm. and just as a side note, um, you know, as, as someone who's been doing this for a while, uh, when I first started, the amount of surgery being done for people with uh, active diverticular disease, with a, an infection actually going, was it's not uncommon. Uh, but as we're talking about, there's really been a transformation where nowadays, you're probably much more likely to have one of us put a, a catheter in to manage the infection. Ultimately, you stay, still may need surgery at some point because that diverticular disease happens, tends to recur and with many bouts. Uh, but it's just an example of how things have really changed in the last 20 years, is trying to avoid surgery pretty much whenever possible. Nobody else? I, I've got another one. Oh, yes. please do. Okay. So Dr. Fowler was talking about collaboration a moment ago. Tumor board comes together, interdisciplinary group with the radiologist, the pathologist, the surgeon. I just lost it. Um, uh, test, yeah, there we go. Um, and, and collaboratively works on, on this issue. What happens with all of your training and expertise. You see, see an image and now you're talking to a specialist, a cardiologist, an ortho, orthopod, and you have a difference of opinion. And you may pull in a colleague, don't know, how do you resolve those issues? Who has chop? <laughs> Who has what? Who has chop? A chop. <laughs> I like to tell people that, you know, there's an old adage, um, the blind men and the elephant, right? and you have three or four blind men around an elephant, one has the trunk, one has the tail, one has the body, and they're all seeing a different animal and yet they're all seeing the same animal. And that's, a lot of things in medicine are like that, is people just have these cognitive biases, these blinders. Uh, that's one of the actual, the best things about being an imaging or radiology is you're talking to virtually everyone across the entire spectrum in healthcare. You learn their lingo, you learn how they think, you learn how they talk, um, so you end up having a very broad perspective of things. And what you often find yourself doing is translating. The surgeon says one thing, but then you talk to the oncologist, and you're the go-between, you're the translator. And so in the fact, what you are is a bit of a storyteller. You become very good at recognizing narratives and developing narratives that help physicians actually understand the problem. That's part of our job, really, is to take data, like Dr. Ross was saying, and convert it into something humans can actually understand, a narrative. And so that's largely what's going on, and that's why I think collaboration actually is something that's 
kind of natural in radiology is we naturally collaborate with everyone uh, just as part of our usual job. And so we, we tend to favor doing that sort of thing. But as far as the answer, sometimes you just close your mouth and say, yes, you're right. Um, you say uh, uh, screening, regular screening is very important. It certainly makes sense, and that's what we're here for. Um, is there, as the technology improves, how long before we can look forward to regular screening and maybe having AI spot the anomalies? So AI in general, um, we're, we're quite far away right now from any sort of general purpose artificial intelligence. I can, I can tell you that the AI that we're currently using, uh, we, we use it on every screening mammogram that we do actually. Uh, it's called CAD. Uh, it's sort of a real basic form of AI. Uh, it's quite terrible. Uh, it's, it's real horrendous actually. It'll call things cancers that are not cancers. Uh, it'll miss cancers. So the technology has a long way to go still, but it's definitely showing promise, uh, particularly in areas of machine learning that has, you know, machines have the ability to synthesize incredibly large data sets and then identify really subtle things. So um, I think the future is bright. We're not quite there yet, but it certainly is gonna be playing a big role in the future. Does that answer your question? Well, yes and no. It's, uh, it sounds like we're not quite there yet. And so the question is, when are we quite there? Yeah. <laughs> Tough to know, yeah, tough to know. I think um, radiologists uh, are really invested in developing that technology. Uh, it has the potential to be an incredible and revolutionizing force in medicine, um, but it, it's just gonna take time for the technology to evolve. Do you have any comments on that, Dr. Uh, well, I, I could go on at length. Um, but in brief, you know, it's helpful to look at other areas of technology to get an idea of where we stand. Um, you know, for instance, uh, automated or uh, cars and automated driving, uh, you know, it's been, we've all heard that that will soon be widely available and yet you find that what really happens is that doing certain things like making the car turn left, you can do, but making the whole system work is an entirely different problem, uh, many orders of magnitude more complicated. And the same is true in medic, uh, medicine and imaging. Um, the tools that Dr. Ross is are referring to, I think, individually can be very good at very specific tasks. But as a broad instrument, nowhere near being ready for prime time. Uh, to your question specifically for screening, this is actually, I think, where it can be very useful because it, in some ways it's a binary question. The test is either normal or requires further evaluation. That's the, exactly the kind of scenario where an AI algorithm probably can do very well. Um, so it can be a fail-safe device to make sure that you know, the exam is truly negative or not. But things get much more complicated past that first step, and that's where I think it's going to be a long time. You, you spoke about cancer a lot, but what technology was it that can detect a tree in bud configuration? Yeah, that's uh, one of our radiology buzzwords that you use. Tree in bud configuration is something that we would identify on a CT of the chest. Yeah, correct, CT of the chest. It's a finding of, can be aspiration or infection or something called uh, microbacteria, atypical microbacterial infection. It can be seen in a number of things. But yeah, to answer your question, it's a finding, an imaging finding on a CT of the chest. Thank you. Any, any last questions? I yeah, have a quick one. Uh, you said that uh, cancer patients need uh, PET scans and we can't do that here. <laughs> Another topic that we could spend all evening, I could literally go on all evening for you. Um, so they do need scans like that, and if you are in the lower 48, you'll get one. No questions asked. It's readily available. Uh, you can get some of these scans done here in Alaska in Anchorage, but what they're literally doing is they're flying that up from Seattle. 
And this isotope that's used has a very short half-life, about two hours. So getting it here to Fairbanks, logistically, very challenging. And um, so my hope is that the people uh, that make the um, machines that produce this isotope, large companies like Siemens, General Electric, you know, very large companies, they recognize that this is a problem. It's not just Alaska, you know, it's Asia, it's Africa. Any place where the population density is quite low, they're joining the rest of the developing world and they expect to get things like PET scans. And General Electric is very smart, they know this. And they're, you know, they are developing equipment that is designed for places like Alaska where it's a, not a very big population density. So bringing this sort of uh, tech, uh, <coughs> technology in state is completely feasible. Um, there are some regulatory issues to overcome. There's always a question of money. Uh, but my hope, or what I feel might be the best way to approach this, is a public-private partnership, particularly through the federal government, perhaps through the university, because this is something that not only is useful clinically and important for cancer patients, there's all sorts of opportunities for research. And so a facility that can operate both as a clinical production site, but also perhaps as a facility for doing research, might provide all sorts of benefits here in the community or somewhere in the state. And so I think uh, that is probably the one thing to focus on is trying to bring that technology to the state. And as soon as that isotope is available, the very next day, we could start doing PET scans. Or at least as fast as we can write a check and get the scanner and turn it on. <laughs> um, that is really the limiting step. It's as simple as that. So absolutely fascinating discussion, presentation. Any, any questions? Let me just point out something. So Dr. Ross is a Lathrop grad. And Dr. Fowler came somewhere out of the interior. Uh, I live just up the street here uh, oh, okay. on so Farmer's Loop. What was your high school? I, I went out of state. Oh. I, I was a bad boy. I had to go okay. to, yeah. So, so a couple of therapists and, and Susan, Susan Bass, who currently is supporting Dr. Fowler and Dr. Ross on the business side, had previous 10 years recruiting physicians to this community, many of whom are uh, Fairbanks, and we'll, we'll hear from more Fairbanks based uh, born uh, docs here in upcoming uh, talks. But with that, to Dr. Fowler and to Dr. Ross, fascinating uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Just one last thing, because you mentioned it. Um, as you may have recognized in my talk, I, I have a strong feeling that the workforce is one of our biggest challenges in the next two to three decades. Both of us came to the WAMI program. I think that is an extraordinarily valuable program. Uh, just this past year, I actually started working with them for teaching to help get more people into medicine, into radiology, to help us deal with this oncoming need for healthcare. So just a little plug for the WAMI program. I know sometimes the legislature gets a little iffy about it. <laughs> it's a very solid program, and a lot of good people come back to work. Great point. Uh, big hand. 